Welcome, everybody. I'm so excited to see everybody here today. Um, my name is Nick Benson. I am the director of the Office of Community Engagement, um, and I'm really pleased to be co-hosting this workshop on community-engaged research uh, with Aaron, who's on the screen next to me. Aaron, do you want to introduce yourself? Thanks, Nick. Uh, I'm Aaron Klein, director of the Research Development Office and the Office of Vice President for Research. And I just kind of want to second what Nick said. I'm really excited that you're all here. I uh, really want to thank Nick for all of his efforts and his team's efforts for putting this together. Our great panelists today, um, as well as Heather, who's not a panelist, but she'll be giving a presentation. Uh, and then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about an upcoming uh, OVPR Community Engaged Scholars um, funding program that's kind of kicking off this year. And we're really hoping that folks can take some of the lessons from today uh, and apply that to putting together applications for that. So stay tuned till the very end to learn a little, learn a little bit more. Nick, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. So as Aaron mentioned, today's sort of has two focus areas. Um, first, we're going to hear from some community-engaged researchers at the University of Iowa, um, hear some best practices and hear about their experiences. And then our hope is, is that that will inspire many of you to consider submitting an application for Aaron Klein's, for, for Aaron's office's new um, grant proposal or grant program, which really was sort of the impetus behind putting together this workshop because we realized that um, this is a fantastic opportunity for a lot of our, our campus that has either already been doing engaged research or is thinking about getting involved in community engaged research uh, to learn a little bit about the process, learn a little bit about the spectrum of engaged research, um, and, then, and then think about applying for this new grant program. So, the agenda for today is we're going to kick things off with Heather Resner, and we're going to ask her to come up and give us sort of an overview of the spectrum of community-engaged research and sort of give us a, a basis to think about this kind of work. Then we're going to transition into a panel discussion with um, three community-engaged researchers here at the University of Iowa who have a lot of experience in this area, and we're going to talk a little bit about best practices and their experiences. Um, and then we'll turn it over to Aaron, um, and uh, he will um, end the show with uh, some information about the grant program. Um, I will tell you that we will encourage questions throughout uh, today's workshop, but I um, ask you to please put that in the chat, and we will moderate that chat um, throughout um, the uh, hour and a half that we have together. And we'll probably have some time at the end also for questions. A couple of other housekeeping items. If you have any um, issues uh, with audio or video or anything, please either direct message me or Noel Mills, who is on the call with us today, and we will be happy to help you. Um, and then the final thing I'll just say is that um, these workshops are something that both Aaron's office and my office do on a fairly regular basis. Um, and if you have interest in community engagement or research, um, and particularly how those things work together, please let us know if there's additional topics that you would like research, uh, or like workshops in, and we'd be happy to um, put on additional workshops. We always like to hear from you, and we like to hear sort of what's on your mind and, and what are the issues that you guys are, are facing right now. Um, so with that, uh, we have a busy day today. So um, once again, thank you all so much for being here. It's great to see you all. Um, and with that, um, I'm gonna invite Heather uh, onto the screen. Can you see my slides? Okay, we'll try that unmuted. So I'm gonna jump straight into it because um, I will talk a little bit about my background as I present today. So let me advance. There we go. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my background, but it's very interwoven with my objectives for today and what I wanna cover in my talk. Um, so that's a little bit cyclical um, as I go through the talk. And then I'm going to dive into some definitions. Uh, please pardon all the words on those slides, but I think they're really important to get at the very specific words. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about frameworks for engaged scholarship, specifically community-based participatory research. And then 
really want to summarize with some themes that I hope come across during the talk, um, and maybe we can add to those. Um, I'm going to start by presenting what I hope is my neutral background. So I have a Bachelor's of Arts in an Art and Anthropology from Luther College in Decorah, Iowa. I immediately went to Maryland, University of Maryland, to get my master's in applied anthropology. Um, ended up working a little bit and then did my PhD in anthropology and did my dissertation with a young man who had gotten involved in drug dealing. I then went into a postdoc in public health and eventually came back to Iowa um, and became a faculty member actually in the College of Medicine. And currently, I'm Associate Director of Engagement, Integration, and Implementation at our Institute for Clinical and Translational Science. Now, um, part of why I wanted to say why neutral is because uh, it's really exciting. There are many, almost all of the colleges actually from across the university are, on, are represented on this call. And so, I wanna present kind of a neutral perspective because um, as many things in this world right now, community engaged scholarship is contested. What does it mean? Um, some people would say it's only community-based participatory research um, and that is acknowledged in Aaron's RFA, but it can be a broad spectrum of things. And so my background is very diverse. You might call it interdisciplinary and I thrive in that space. But right now I wanna call it neutral from a perspective of trying to provide a, a broad base of what community-based scholarship could be or can be. So my objectives are on a, my minor objective is to thread the needle, <laughs> to provide you some background on, um, to include my background and perspective on community-engaged research, but really to let you know where that's coming from, or in essence, my bias around community-engaged um, scholarship, as well as some concrete definitions and frameworks that you could hopefully use um, in your process of doing engaged um, scholarship. My main or major goal of the presentation is really to bring as many uh, University of Iowa faculty into community engaged scholarship as possible in a thoughtful and respectful way. I have to use my mouse, so this is a little challenging. Um, but I add that this is from those with little experience to those who are deeply embedded in communities already and doing uh, work. So, um, it's really partly an invitation, but then also for those who are already doing this work, hopefully there's something in here for you as well. So really wanted to shoot this as broadly as possible and see if, that, see if we can get that. So specifically, the perspective I bring right now um, is from the National Center of Advanced and Translational Sciences, which is the um, National Institutes of Health Center. So, that's where my position is now and where I'm trying to figure out how to promote community engaged um, research. So I'm gonna start with a question and I can't see the chat, so feel free to jump in, but how long does it take to get research findings into routine clinical practice? This is the question that we really are trying to um, attack with NCATS. So Nick, could you let me know what people are saying? <laughs> Any guesses? Even if you know the answer, just put it in. I only see one chat. Nope, starting. We've had a few people say 10 years, 17 years, too long. <laughs> too long is good. So someone knows the answer. So the answer is 17 years. Um, it's probably not exactly 17 years, but I use this article because they actually, this is a review article that looked at several different ones that were looking at that question. And actually three um, articles came up with 17 years. So that's why we tend to use that number. So yeah, too long. 
it takes for our uh, evidence base or our research understandings to get into routine practice so everyone is benefiting from them. So what have our responses been to this uh, as a scientific community to this time lag? Now I'm gonna do um, very specific examples from where I sit. So one is that translational science spectrum where you're starting with that preclinical or foundational research all the way to translating it to population. So this is one way we frame it or talk about that pipeline is T0 to T4. Um, NCATS or the Clinical and Translational Science Awards have um, presented it visually. It's the same idea of T0 through T4, but a little different representation and different language, which I like, um, clinical implementation, public health. Um, interestingly, they really uh, eventually put patient involvement right at the center of how they visualize this. So I would also argue some of those responses have been um, thinking about pragmatic or real world trials. So instead of randomized control trials that have very specific inclusion and exclusion criteria, but thinking about how we can do them more in the real world so that once um, it's proven that it, it works or the evidence shows that it works, that it will actually work for more people right away. Um, at least that's the goal. Um, implementation science, which is the field I tend to work in and I've done a, most of my work actually in the VA. So I use their, um, one of their centers that works in implementation science, but really it's actually research looking at how we do that process of getting research into practice and actually studying that process and how we can um, get that to be faster and work more effectively. And then finally, I would actually argue that community or uh, patient engaged research is part of that process, uh, part of shortening that time lag because the idea is that if we involve the community, if we involve patients earlier on or from the beginning, we will be doing research that matters to them, understanding it in a way that um, brings their perspective into it so that when the research is actually brought into routine practice, it will happen faster because it's actually meeting the needs that they set out or asked for. Now, I wanna pause a little bit and frame it from another way to consider the question. And that is to think about it a little broader, but what have our academic or scientific community responses been to social inequalities? And think about those same um, things that I just talked about that, to shorten that gap from research to practice from the perspective of addressing health disparities or health equity. Um, many of these same things are trying to address disparities as well, or at least that's part of why we're doing them. And so I want to keep that in mind in part because um, if you look at the begin very beginnings of community-based participatory research or community-engaged research, it was really a method to develop, develop to address health disparities and create health equity or disparities and equity if you don't do health research like I do. So I just wanted to bring those different strains of thought, those different um, areas of discourse all together, because I think they are all informing, informing each other in different ways. And I think it's a, interesting to think about as we um, move into the community engaged research space. So specifically, um, NCATS um, was pretty roundly critiqued by um, the Institute of a medicine um, at the time for not doing enough community engaged research or not highlighting them enough as part of their um, request for proposals and things like that. So they've done some work on trying to think through community engagement in NCATS more specifically. So that's um, where I'm currently sitting um, from thinking about um, community engaged research. And then their publications around like what Ann Katz did to respond to that. They talk about this public particip 
participation spectrum. And this is from um, the International Association for Public Participation. And it's really trying to push civic engagement um, in this direction of public participation. And so um, I do wanna spend just a little bit of time on this where it's um, going from starting with just informing. So the goal, the goal of that public participation is to provide the public with a balanced objective information to assist them in making decisions essentially. And then it goes um, through all of these from consult, so obtaining feedback and analysis, um, to involvement, working with them directly in the process to ensure that public concerns are consistently understood, to actually partnering with the public in the aspects of decision-making and developing alternatives, looking for solutions, to the point of empowerment where you're placing the final decision actually in the public stand. So this is, um, it was interesting to me to find out that NCATS took this um, framework and then they actually developed their own from a, from a perspective of doing it in um, translational science. So INFORM became outreach um, to different communities and talking really about how the flow of communication works. And empowerment became shared leadership. Um, and this is actually where I don't think they quite pushed it far enough, but strong bi-directional uh, relationship. Um, but they do say the final decision-making is at the community level. So in thinking about your potential work engaging communities, I think this type of spectrum, either the um, public participation one or this one with NCATS or others that you might find um, are nice places to um, think about as you're thinking about where you're entering in or where you're thinking about engaging a community. So now specifically, um, thinking about engage, community-engaged research, community-based participatory research is really considered the gold standard, I would say. Um, it's part of what I talked about with contested space, but it does, um, I think it does provide us with really important um, where we would want to get to when we're doing community-engaged research. So this is where I'm gonna get into the words um, in depth. So this is, one definition, but a really good one, a collaborative approach to research that equitably involves all partners in the research process and recognizes the unique strengths that each brings. CDPR begins with a research topic of importance to the community and has, uh, can't see my word, has the aim of combining knowledge with action and achieving social change to improve health outcomes and eliminate health disparities. Again, please insert um, the area that you work in. And I just want to highlight that this um, is actually an article um, with Edith Parker as a co-author, and she's our Dean of College of Public Health and really um, seen as renowned in the field of community-based participatory research. And then just to emphasize the research topic of importance to the community, that's really the focus. And that's often where we fall short because it's really can be challenging to understand what the community wants to have research, match it with expertise of the researchers themselves, and then get funding to actually do the research. There's a lot of pieces that have to, that need to fall into place to reach that gold standard. Um, but, it's obviously an um, uh, important goal to look towards um, as all gold standards are. That's why they get their name. So then one last thing is uh, in these diving in all, into all the words is what is community? Um, and one piece that I'm gonna show you later, they talk about community is the unit of identity and I like that language. So what does that mean? Um, the community, this is a CBR PR definition from that, um, from their book. Um, so it's community consists of emotional connections to other members 
shared values and norms, mutual influence, common interests, joint commitment to shared needs. Thus, community can be geographically centered, such as a neighborhood, or maybe geographically dispersed, such as persons who share characteristics, race, sexual identity, for example. So thinking about that, um, I think that's a great place to start when you're thinking about community um, and as you're thinking about your own uh, potential research um, topics. But I did wanna share NCAT's definition as well. So community defined is defined as all stakeholders connected to clinical and transitional research. Communities may include, but are not limited to nonprofit industry entities engaged in translational research and might include disease advocacy groups, local, local healthcare providers, community-based organizations, and other national or local communities. So a different framing. And so I just want to put that up there as an, another example of thinking about community. So um, there are some clear challenges if you put those two definitions of community um, up against each other as community as identity. A real emphasis on common interests and shared needs versus thinking about stakeholders who could have not common interests and not common uh, needs around, um, but they're all stakeholders in the same topic, the same area you're focused on. <clears throat> and then a real emphasis on equity. Um, versus an NCATS, really an emphasis on evidence-based medicine and routine practice. Um, but I'm an anthropologist, as it probably was clear in presenting the background. So this is a very different way of kind of thinking about community for me. And so I've spent um, probably the past three years, almost three years thinking about this and thinking about how we think about this really broadly. So what I've come to my resolution is our engage, uh, engagement, integration, and implementation model and process. So what we're really trying to do in ICTS is get researchers to think about stakeholders from the very beginning of the research and think as broadly as possible about who those stakeholders are. So um, brainstorming and thinking about that very early on and then engaging them actually in the research questions in the research process. This integration has many circles around it because what we're trying to do is think about all of those different stakeholders in the scientific process and think about how do you integrate their perspectives into the scientific questions and kind of go back and forth um, in an iterative process. That process does lead to um, evidence or findings or outcomes that you actually want to implement that are um, want to spread and scale up. And that's where implementation comes in. But with the emphasis that the whole reason that you started with the stakeholders is because you want to impact those same stakeholders. So if you engage them early in the process, continue to integrate um, their perspectives in the scientific process, and then as well as through implementation, the idea or the goal is hopefully that implementation will be more successful. So that is how I've taken kind of the perspective of NCATS and community engagement and really stakeholder engagement, to be honest, um, and thought through it in my own process. And that's um, really what I'm hoping that my presentation spurs from you. Um, I did include this one slide um, in case you're interested in looking more into CPPR specifically. It's something I saw a while ago now, um, but I just liked the summary of CPPR here um, and the way it was talked about. And I'm sure my kids would be completely embarrassed, but these are supposed to look like um, Facebook Live likes. And, you know, I don't even have Facebook, but we'll just pretend that that's what it looks like. And so summarizing things, um, I hope that you take away from this that it's okay to take baby steps. Um, that I really ask that you think about what does community engaged scholarship look like in your specific field or in your discipline? Um, 
that community engaged scholarship exists on a continuum. The goal is respectful engagement and long term partnerships that are mutually beneficial. Um, the gold standard is CBPR, and that um, community engaged research is rooted in uh, equity work. And then I included um, different values or perspectives um, that really surround um, community engaged research for scholarship. And then I wanted to end with a little bit of Iowa trivia, which was the um, was the painting that I showed at the be very beginning of the talk. So, does anyone know what this painting is? Who painted it, and what the story is behind it? It is Grant Wood. Does anyone know the story? So. I live in Cedar Rapids, um, and this is, if you would like to go see this painting, it is in the Cedar Rapids Museum, Art Museum. Uh, it is called, should, um, I did not know that, thank you, Frank. Um, it is called Young Corn, and there's all the, at least the story that we're told in Cedar Rapids is all this little young corn is supposed to be all the children all the kids who attend Cedar Rapids Public Schools, which Grant Wood actually taught in Cedar Rapids Public Schools, um, and that they will grow up to be healthy members of the community. So thank you very much. And um, I'm very glad we have a great panel to talk about specific examples of community engaged um, scholarship. But I'm also happy to join and have uh, answer questions if people have. So thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. And I do want to, uh, say before we go any farther that um speaking I, I love that you brought up a grant wood painting um because actually the director of the grant wood art colony is on our call today i believe mora is here which is a part of our office um and and a great example of another field of community engagement that is very robust at the university of iowa which is our engagement through the arts um, and I think that a lot of the concepts that you talked about around community identity and how we define what community is, that we see that playing out through our arts engagement as well. Um, and okay. I won't ask Maura to, to say more, but I, but I, I know that she could, so. <laughs> hey. Well, thank you so much, Heather. This has been fantastic. Um, I think what we'll do is I don't see any questions right now in the chat. So let's scooch right on to our panel. Um, and so I will ask Brandy and Lindsay and Dave up onto the screen. And can everybody hear me okay? I changed my microphone. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Well, um, I am so pleased to have Lindsay and Brandy and Dave here with us today. Um, these are our three researchers here at the University of Iowa who I have known for years, um, pretty much the entire time I've been doing community engagement at the University of Iowa, I've been connected with Dave and Lindsay and Brandy. Um, and they are seasoned researchers and I know they have a lot of, of uh, um, experience and best practices to share with us. Um, so I want to jump in and get started right away. I think what I might do first is just go around the circle and ask everybody to introduce themselves and just briefly tell us about generally what is their research focused on um, and, and how have you sort of, you know, um, how do you involve community within your research? So Lindsay's right to my right. So Lindsay, I might start with you if that's okay. Hello, everyone. It's, I'm so honored to be asked to be part of the panel. Um, I'm Lindsay Maddock. I'm an associate professor in the School of Library and Information Science. Um, being part of LIS, um, I think much like Heather, we're, we're an inherently interdisciplinary field. Um, we're also very publicly engaged um, and are training our students to go into, into areas of librarianship and working directly with the public. Um, so I think community engagement is something that just kind of naturally tied into, um, into my research, although it was not always lauded um, as, I, as I moved on with my, with my PhD. Um, but uh, the work that I do is focused and centered in community archives um, and, and much, 
as, as Heather um, articulated, right, um, community uh, morphs and changes depending on the type of archives or the, 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 um, the type of community that I'm working with. So that can be everything from a community of practice to identity-based communities. Um, I've worked across that spectrum of, of engagement as well. Um, a lot of this also grounded in, in teaching. So I think that um, that line between research and teaching is, is very blurred uh, for me and I don't necessarily separate the two, but em embrace community engaged practice in both, both areas. Thank you, Wendy. Brandy, uh, how about you next? Sure. Um, <clears throat> my name is Brandy Jansen and I'm a clinical associate professor in the College of Public Health. I'm in the Department of Occupational and Environmental Health. I'm also really delighted to be here and see colleagues from both sides of the river, which is always fun to get us in one space. Um, I'm, uh, I'm also trained as an anthropologist. Um, <clears throat> and so I come to this kind of as a traditional ethnographer, um, at least initially, where uh, I didn't, I, I'm not trained as a community-based researcher, but you kind of learn through the course of an ethnographic project that your questions change and then they become the community's questions. And so um, it's not as formalized, but I, when I think about the trajectory of my, my research, that's usually what has happened is I have some questions and I realize those really aren't maybe the most interesting questions. And so I change them. And in the meantime, I'm also usually working with community partners to do other things in their service often, you know, writing grants with folks or kind of developing programs in communities and it sort of morphs into this different thing. Um, but in my current role, I, I do a few things. Um, I direct a state-funded center, Iowa Center for Agricultural Safety and Health, um, which is a, uh, an engagement and outreach center devoted to reducing illnesses and injuries in agriculture. And there, there are a lot, that's a different talk altogether. Um, but that's less about doing the research and uh, more about thinking about how the translational component and moving research into practice in a farm environment, <clears throat> which is, you know, looks very different than a clinical environment, but um, the, trans <clears throat> the translational piece is important there. I also direct our community engagement cores for two NIEHS funded centers. Um, one is the Environmental Health Sciences Research Center, um, and that's a role of uh, engaging environmental health science with community needs. And so I'm not the researcher. We're working with a lot of uh, toxicologists and bench scientists and people doing really cutting edge research. Um, it's our job to kind of draw the line from that research to community interests. Um, and we do a few things. Uh, one strategy is getting our stakeholders, for example, involved in uh, pilot grant reviews so that they, we have community members starting to vet the science, which I think is an important way to help them think about and, and really drive our questions. And then the third piece is another NIEHS funded center, the Iowa Superfund Research Program. Um, I also direct that community engagement core. Um, and that role to me feels uh, a lot more like the kind of traditional um, community-based research. So we have schools and organizations and other community partners. They have concerns about environmental contamination. Um, so we go in and sample and report back results and help them think through what their data mean um, and you know how might they communicate it to their constituents. We work with schools, which um, you know, so being really careful about how we um, give good information, but not information that um, frankly causes people to flip out. I think that's a technical term. <laughs> Sometimes it happens, you know, so um, the kind of threading, threading the needle, as Heather said, um, to kind of to match those things up. Um, I've also done some more, I see Kate joining me on the call. So I've done some work recently with IHR and um, proposing some really awesome uh, quote, I hope they get funded proposals that have engaged community members, even at the grant writing process. Um, at that stage. So um, hopefully those will be to, to be continued. So I'll stop there. Thanks. It's good to be here. Thank you so much, Brandy. Dave, would you like to go? Sure. Hopefully you all can hear me okay. And Brandy's a nice segue. Um, she said something that really resonated with me is what, I wasn't really trained in any of the community as a community engaged researcher. I'm essentially a, a, a chemist and an engineer in the Department of Civil, Civil Environmental Engineering that focuses on water quality um, and a lot of what really got me doing more engaged research was my role as a director for the Center of Health Effects of Environmental Contamination. So very much akin to what Brandy was saying with the EHSRC. We have discovered that routinely communities will reach out to us with concerns and um, we work with them to sort of, we integrate them into that process of doing the research from our end. And 
um, it, it's been a good experience. And so that's one way we do it is we've worked with mobile home communities. We've worked with um, communities in Muscatine County. I can talk about some of the examples, but they, they bring to us concerns. And then it's really trying to holistically integrate them into that process of discovering, um, you know, if those concerns are founded and then helping empower them to, to make change. Um, I think engaged research is just a phenomenal way to train our students. And so I'm the other thing that I try to do, and I think Lindsay had said this, you know, sort of the teaching and scholarship and also this mentoring of students. Um, we've just launched a new program in the grad college and interdisciplinary master's degree in sustainable development and the vision for that. And we've piloted it with a few students is essentially a project based thesis that's done in partnership. Uh, with uh, community. And so we've had some students that have gotten their MS degrees by working with, say, the city of Iowa City on needs that they bring to us and working very collaboratively and essentially having the student be shared between, you know, the university and, and the entity that we're working with towards that common goal. Um, and the students love it. And then the last thing is, I, I think maybe it's not surprising, but inevitably it's driven my own research in that direction. And so I'm like, for example, I'm currently working on an NSF project with a team down at the University of South Florida. We're working with frontline communities on issues around climate change and public health and water quality. And so working, you know, these frontline communities, you can think of them as the first and the worst when it comes to what they're experiencing with climate change, predominantly racial minorities, and sort of working with those communities to build tools and resources to sort of um, hopefully improve what they're going to be dealing with as our climate changes. And I think it's whether, I, I don't know, I come here and I see all these great people in attending, like Kate was mentioned, Brianna, and I saw Travis was on, my partner in crime, Teresa, and I always sort of feel like um, a lot of people could be up here. So I'm honored to be here. And um, um, I know many of you in the audience could, could are doing great work and thanks for attending. Thank you so much, Dave. And I, actually, I would echo what you said, Dave. We, I see a lot of people in the audience that, that are fantastic community-engaged researchers, and, and I'm so happy to have you here. I will say, though, that I do know that we have some folks that are sort of just getting started with their, um, with their research path um, and thinking about community-engaged research that are here, too. And so I wanted to sort of first start out by touching on, I think, what sort of all three of you sort of mentioned, which was that all of you sort of got started with community engaged research in different ways. And some of you were sort of formally, maybe more formally or less formally trained. And so I wonder if you wanna just talk a little bit about like, what was that gateway process for you like? Did somebody mentor you? Um, did you, know, you sort of scramble your first few times uh, through this to kind of figure your way? Um, what did that look like to you? And sort of what have you learned as a result of that, that you are sort of trying to, um, you know, uh, instill in students or um, in, in people that are part of our university here today? I can, I can jump in if you like. Um, I thought this was a, this was a great question. You had me kind of sitting and spinning my wheels and really thinking about those first experiences, but, um, I think as the as the Humanities for Public Good grant work through the through the Oberman has been demonstrating, I think a lot of this innovation happens um, sometimes from from doctoral students. And it was a fellow doctoral student that I started working with that we started identifying um, collections across our community um, as we were doing our training that that folks needed help with and assistance with, and were asking for our support with. Um, so it, it became um, a collaborative effort working together to try and sort out how we could situate our, both the, the research questions that we were interested in, um, along with the course that we were, the courses that we were teaching um, and align um, uh, along with the needs of the community and align all of those things together so that the communities could get the support that they needed to achieve their goals. And, and we could also integrate that and, and into our research um, and I think better inform the, the theory. Um, but I think it's it's always been collaborative. Um, it, the, the work started working within the communities that I was already connected with um, being established uh, as, a, as a doctoral student for some time in a place. Um, but when I landed at the University of Iowa and was really interested in doing this work, it's it's uh, places like the Office of Engagement, the Oberman Center, the IISC um, that became the centers for helping to connect me to those communities, um, along with 
uh, working across those those areas of expertise. So I think it it it, it kind of takes a community to to do community engaged um, research, uh, and that's one thing that the question really made me reflect on. Um, it's never me as a as a solo solo scholar. And I'll chime in. I mean, one of the things that I've I think I actually started not like about my field as sort of more of a traditional academician is that when you were doing it as an environmental engineer, we basically started out as like as a foundational need for society, right? We needed clean water, we need clean air. And there was a point where we were entirely driven by trying to, to serve the general public. Um, and, you know, as I started out as a professor, we, you know, you get very much as a bench scientist, really far removed from what the goal of the field was. Um, and so I, I guess in some ways, I've been lucky that there have been examples of people who have in my discipline, in my field, that have continued to try to embody that, that when there are issues in communities, um, that they're willing to get out there and, and work with them. And so, you know, I turned to those colleagues, like when we were first approached at Cheek early on when I took over, and it was kind of a change for how we were using our resources to try to turn it inwardly here in Iowa, um, I reached out to folks. I, I knew folks at the University of Iowa that were doing it. I mean, I've, I've known Brandy since I've got here and it's great work. And so I could talk to people in public health um, or I could talk to colleagues that are engineers at other dis at other universities and just learn from them, hear from them. And then um, I you know I, I made sure that um, I communicated a lot with the people we were working with from the get-go because that communication made me just feel better about it. Like I felt like if we're all on the same page and I'm honest with them about, you know, this is me getting into this space, um, that it would make it easier. And, and it did. And I think I've gotten more comfortable with it as we've gone along. And so, you know, rely on those colleagues because, you know, you shouldn't feel like you have to reinvent the wheel um, and you shouldn't feel like you're alone and don't have any resources because there are tremendous people here that can kind of just give you some ideas of how to get going. Yeah, I agree. And I, like, it's the community, but it, there's, there's also a need for some structure that I think that's from my perspective. So I'm thinking about, um, you know, as Lindsay said, sort of makes you spin your wheels and think about how did this really happen for me? Um, when I was doing my dissertation research, I remember I was saying things like, well, I really want this to result in like practical solutions. Now I will tell you my dissertation research did not really result in any practical solutions for anybody. It was a perfectly fine ethnographic project. And I I answered some questions that were of interest to community partners, but it wasn't really like, I didn't have a toolkit or anything by the end of it. And so that kind of movement from something, from answering an interesting question, which is not a bad outcome in itself, to something kind of concrete, that was a hard, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know how to do that. And so when I took the role in public health uh, and had the had a structure of a center um, that had a really robust advisory board, a lot of colleagues, people with a lot more knowledge than I did about the field, frankly, um, helped me a lot think about, oh, okay, now here's how you go from answering a question to thinking about, let's give people something more practical, something, you know, that they can do something with. Um, and so for me, the having the kind of structure of a uh, of an entity was really helpful. Um, that doesn't, you know, that's not always a possibility, you know, in, in a, any individual role, but thinking about what are the structures of support would be another way to think about it that kind of help you move from I answered the question, now what do I do about it? Which was sometimes the hard jump to make. I do think that's a great point, Brandy. And actually all three of you sort of touched on something that I thought was really good, which is that um, in some way or another, you all had some kind of support to help you through the process and get you to sort of um, think about the questions that you're trying to answer. And that sort of leads me to my next question, um, which is, you know, Brandy, you, you, you mentioned that, you know, you ask these questions, but then how do you translate that into actual community engaged work? And so I wonder if, if the three of you can talk a little bit about, you know, sitting here now, having the experiences that you've had, what does your process look like in terms of when you're starting a project or you're, you're, you're asking a question, um, how do you engage community partners in that you know do you do you come to them with that question is it more of a relationship based process now where you basically are sort of in continual um, questioning with your community partners you know i guess i'm asking the practical question is is how is it actually operationalized for you right now 
I'll start and just say it totally depends. <laughs> it's like different every time and you think you got it like, okay, we'll do this thing again. It's like, no, we actually won't do that thing again. We'll do something. It's going to look different depending on who. And, and it's the, it's things like the funding mechanism and the time frame and the topic that you have, you know, like it's not just the reality is when you get to the nuts and bolts of doing academic research, you want to serve the community's needs, but you have to pay for it somehow. And you have to pay for it by making an argument to another entity that you're doing something worthwhile and making those two things meet. So every time it feels like it's kind of a new, even, even if I'm going back to community partners, I already know it's like a, a new, so kind of here, we've got this opportunity. It seems like we've talked about these things. Maybe there's a way to make it work. And, and we, we see if that, um, if, if it can match. I'm, I'm thinking again about a recent proposal that, that Kate was involved in where we did involve community partners at the, at the writing process, which was awesome, but it kind of felt like, boy, we had somebody at the ready. Kate had great relationships with them. They were up for it, which was awesome. Um, and the funding mechanism actually made sense. So when all those stars align, it feel, then you're like, hey, I'm doing, I'm doing the gold standard thing, but it, it's not always that. It doesn't always work that way. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, the easiest situations are when we're approached and then we can sort of communicate very openly and clearly. And so that, that point that Heather was making about identifying the research need, in some ways that's easy because they bring it to you. It may not be fully formulated, but they let you know what they're interested in. And then the, the sort of it falls on us to make sure we're engaging them appropriately along the way and find ways to get them involved with the different steps of say the study design. I'll also admit I'm pretty fortunate at the center that I run and that we have a bit of a budget. So we're not then, once we come up with an idea uh, together, we're not beholden to finding an agency that also deems it worthy. We can throw a little bit of money at it to get things going. Um, and so I admit that in some ways that's made it probably far easier than most for me to be able to do this. Um, we do do instances where we go out and we look for people to work with. That's much harder. <laughs> <laughs> um, because no matter how much of a reputation we have, it's still hard to get people to want to, you know, to have that trust from the get go. And so I don't have a, a magical recipe there for success. We get turned down a lot when we're trying to find people. It's we try to find good, good entry points. You know, I've talked to you, Nick, about where you've got footholds and people that will at least listen. And then we kind of talk. Um, but it, it's a lot of, I, I feel like our success rate is really low there. And then, um, you know, the last thing I'll add is there's a lot of interest, I think, from funding agencies these days to do more of this type of work. I'm one of the, I mentioned that grant with South Florida, and it's actually a program by the National Science Foundation where they're very interested in use inspired research, which is sort of how they're dealing, they're thinking about this end user integrated need. Um, and they're actually giving us a year to basically build and do that gold standard. So we've got the people that are building out the sort of scripts that we use when we go and we actually bring in community partners and it's very iterative. And, and so it's actually nice. The money is just to do that. And so I would encourage folks to think more and more about finding those opportunities where agencies seem to understand the need to do this sort of thing correctly and not, and this is something we've done wrong many times as engineers is just sort of parachute in and then bail out and then leave communities no better off than we found them. Uh, you know, so it, it's encouraging in some ways that agencies are beginning to feel the need to, to do that right. And the whole Pro that project actually after a year of building gives us a chance to write that proposal that's integrated to get a bunch of money to actually then do it at, at scale. Um, so that, that's been a good exercise too, because it's nice to remind yourself of that gold standard every now and again, Brandy. Yeah, I, I, I think I've had a similar experience. Those, those relationships that you already have established or, um, the, the projects where folks are, are coming to you, um, again, through the Office of Engagement, through the IISC, um, those are communities who have, who have already committed to a partnership with the University of Iowa, have a project in mind, but need the support to do that work. Um, so having the community define what that project's going to be, but from kind of that rough idea, um, but then be able to negotiate that, particularly within the classroom projects, right, that I'm bringing into the coursework, um, being able to make sure that those projects meet the, the goals of the course um, and, and shaping those in a way, too, that we can we can pass something off after a short term relationship or continue a relationship. Um, uh, I think, as Dave mentioned, 
sustaining those those relationships too has been really important. Everything's been kind of an iterative process. So even though I've worked on a lot of um, projects that seem kind of disconnected um, within the classroom, those are culminating now in a um, a grant with the um, IMLS, the Institute for Library and Museum Services, um, which is uh, looking more broadly at how we can build curricula and best practices that are going to better serve um, scale up rather than than looking at these big institutions that are generating the best practices in our field that don't scale down um, to the to the community organizations that that need support to to provide access to collections. Um, And and that's been through internal grants have been extraordinarily helpful for that. Um, We received um, research collaborator Micah Bateman and I received a grant from the Oberman Center over the summer that helped us to kind of sit down and spend the time and talk to um, some of the folks that we've already worked with to uh, design this grant proposal and, and push that forward. Um, so the, the, the resources are, are there and sometimes it's just it's just a little bit of, um, or, or a great deal of support, I would say, that, that's provided from um, some of these different places across the university that have allowed um, those projects to, to succeed. You know, Frank uh, Durham has a great question here. And I think it, it's, it's something that sort of um, I was thinking about as, as actually all three of you have sort of mentioned this idea of, of community need. And, and, you know, like Dave, you mentioned, or maybe Brandy, I can't remember who was saying, you know, um, you know, trying to, trying to like connect your question with community need. How do you actually identify what are the community needs? Is it, is there a process, uh, a formal process that you use to identify community need? I mean, I'll start and I'm just going to, I'll share the experience I'm going through on this current project um, where we're very fortunate to um, have the ability to essentially do a lot of, you know, formal focus groups, interviews, and kind of talk generally about, obviously we have our expertise that bounds what we're interested in, but then really hear from the communities that we're working with like where specifically inside that bound they have their their specific issue, right? And um, I'll say it's actually been really challenging for our research team because I think you go in with a lot of assumptions and you go in knowing, well, this is what I think I can do. And then you have to be open to hearing something completely different (laughs) and completely undermining um, maybe even the makeup of your team. And um, we've been okay with that because I think that's, part of this process of really doing it where you with, you know, equitably, where you go in and you have no, you should have, it's, you know, you don't want to have preconceived notions. You don't have biases. You don't want to force your interests upon them. Um, So that's been actually really good. Um, But I also understand that nine times out of 10, you don't have that opportunity. And so, you know, normally what we try to do in that space is we go in very, um, you know, with, I think of the things we're doing with Cheek, where we go in and, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about water quality, drinking water, health, and sort of ask folks about where they have concerns or where they've been hearing concerns. And then we try to build from there. On the things we do, we were trying to do with this project-based master's program is it's identifying partners that we trust first, that we have relationships with, and then just having those conversations of, you know, how can we work together? Where is their need? And so I think it, that differs a lot depending on how, I guess, how much history you have with the, with the group, um, in my perspective. But I'd love to hear what the others have to say. I would agree with that. I think time is, is also a, a big element in that. Um, uh, in, in the projects where we're working in a specific course for a semester, there's, there's not as much time to do. I think the, the kind of the, the, broader conversations with with more community members where we might just have a few points of contact with with different stakeholders that are representing a our larger group of, of constituents or, or stakeholders in the project um whereas like the the larger grant that um that we have under uh under consideration at the moment is um we have many more conversations leading up to the proposal and part of the grant itself is sitting down and talking to more stakeholders and spending that time to do that investigative work. 
Um, so it, it just kind of depends on the, on the scale of the project and the amount of time that you have to, to complete it. I think the, the deeper you can go, the, the more robust the, the end results will be. Um, but it's not to say that those shorter term projects don't, don't also have a, have a broad impact. Um, to, to give one example, um, the last couple of projects we've been working with trying to provide access to collections um, that have been hidden um, in a couple of different community libraries. Um, and all we were able to accomplish was a very small piece of the project within the confines of a semester. Um, but the pandemic ended up presenting a huge opportunity for a lot of these collections where we set them off with a framework, we gave them the tools that they needed um, and a workflow to move forward with, with finishing the project. And in order to keep people employed um, when they were going to have to send people home because they were closing their, their libraries, they were able to say, no, 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 now we've got the time and the capacity to work on, on this project. Um, so even something that seemed kind of small scale ended up keeping people employed and working during, um, during the first stages of the pandemic when everybody was set home. So it was really encouraging to see those collections um, available to the communities, but also that, that the project kind of had a life beyond what we had initially imagined. Yeah, that's sort of along the lines of what I was thinking too. I'm, as an anthropologist, I tend to go into assuming everything is data as far as I'm concerned. And so, you know, I'm, I'm reflecting with our um, Environmental Health Sciences Research Center, we do a sort of a series of, um, we call them science cafes. So we, it's a very informal community-based discussion. Those are, you get a wealth of knowledge out of those meetings. Um, if you pay attention to what questions people are asking, sort of, um, we, and we do formal sort of surveys, what topics are you interested in? That, what other, you know, outreach could we provide? And that helps us with that little program, but it also kind of opens up and helps us understand what questions at the community level might be. And so if you take, you know, we think broadly across, you know, most, most of us have lots of plates spinning. Um, and if you think across all of them, they start to inform each other and, and think about it. Well, I'm, I'm working with this group and I'm hearing this from them. And so can I, is this similar over here? So you kind of start to cross pollinate things and, and think of everything as an opportunity to learn about what the community, however you define it, needs or what the dif differences are within the communities. I work in rural spaces a lot and I think we tend to think of the rural as this kind of homogenous thing. And of course it's not, you know, there's a lot of power differences and, and really interesting social dynamics in rural spaces. But so thinking and, and observing for those also kind of helps me think about, well, what might be helpful? What, what questions might, might um, appeal to people? Um, what things might they want to engage in? And I'm glad Brandy mentioned that because I, I, I think you got to find ways to get out and actually start having the conversations um, and hearing, right? And so, you know, I think something that's been kind of pounded into me over and over again when I talk to folks is when you get that chance, ask open-ended questions and then listen and, and listen really well um, and really give the communities that you're interacting with a chance to sort of freely talk about what their concerns are, what their issues might be that they want to know more about. So Brandy in the Science Cafes has an outstanding way to get at that and hear that information. So finding whatever mechanisms there are where you can gather that data and, and just being really good at listening to what's being said if it's not being done in something even as official as a survey form. You know, all of you have had very successful careers in, in research and in community engagement. And I wonder if you can give us an example of when it's gone really well. Like what is something that you look at and say, this is why I do this work. This is why I do community engaged research. Can you, can you give us an example? I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the student training work that we've done. I mean, I had a, a student here at the university that um, I first met in the first year seminar <laughs> and that was on drinking water issues. And then she went on to do a degree in environmental science and ended up working in my lab later on and then wanted to do a master's degree. And we were sort of piloting with support from the grad college, the vision of what we wanted to do, um, what we wanted to do for this project-based master's, sort of this engaged, getting the students actually working with, with a, a community. And so that student, Anna Seeger, worked with the city of Iowa City. Again, we went with, we were trying to build something, you know, and just see how it would work for the student. Um, 
And so we went with a, a partner we, we knew we could have a good relationship with. This was Brenda Nation at the time. She was working at the city. Uh, and Anna was working with Iowa City on looking at issues like their stormwater infrastructure and some of the challenges they have around that, trying to be essentially helping on an aspect of their climate uh, adaptation plan that has sort of fallen through the cracks. Um, and so Anna got to go out and engage with all the folks in the city, um, talk with them, you know, go out and actually be in some of the neighborhoods that were having flooding that was happening from some of the stormwater infrastructure not being properly sized, generated a bunch of great products that the city could benefit from. Um, you know, and then she went and when it was all said and done, DNR here in Iowa snatched her up in a heartbeat because they loved that she had already been engaged in working on issues that were relevant to Iowa and Iowa communities. So that like couldn't have gone any better <laughs> in my mind. Um, and, and I know it was kind of, it's, it's maybe a little bit of a formulated case because working with the city of Iowa City when you're at the University of Iowa, you might expect it to be a little bit of, you know, the, it's all kind of set up. It was still challenging. We had a lot of communication barriers to overcome. We had a lot of meeting barriers to overcome. Brenda retired in the middle of it, um, all these things. And, um, you know, so it was a good lesson just to show that, um, you know, even things that might feel like they're going to be easy have all sorts of, and the whole time I, we're just trying to keep Anna moving forward because she wants to finish with her degree. Um, so I, I, we were really pleased how that turned out. And uh, by all accounts, the state of Iowa was lucky to have her at the Iowa Department of Natural Resources from what I'm hearing. So that, that I feel is a win because the student outcome was good. The student learned from it and got, um, you know, sort of advanced and stay here in the state, which is wonderful. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, for me, I think I feel most successful when I when I realize that people want to continue to engage. Which, you know, when you say, "Do you want to?" and they say, "Yeah," <laughs> and I feel like, "Okay, we've done something right." And I'm thinking about that with one of our, you know, we have a really robust stakeholder advisory board in both several of the centers that I'm engaged with, um, and you know, when I ask them are you interested in reviewing pilot grants, right? So now all of us the academics in the room, sometimes when you get the, would you review this pilot grant? Sometimes your response is, if I have to, I will, right? Um, but they were, they were like, yeah, they want to be involved in the process. And that tells me that we have kind of collectively done something right, that they, they want to keep, keep engaging with us and that they bring ideas and that they trust us to sort of move them forward. And then we go back and we, we massage things a little bit more. And, and so to me, when, when that happens, I feel like it's gone well. Yeah, I think I can, I can think of similar examples where students have um, gone on to cite uh, projects uh, as, as one of the key foundational pieces to their learning and been able to secure jobs um, based on that experience. I know the, I think it was the very first engagement project I worked with Nick on um, through the historic Hills Scenic Byway. Um, we had students go out and, and work with a number of small collections and then come back and use those findings as a way to design a workshop. Um, and the students did all of the work and that the, the publication, the, the resource guide we, we created together, I, I, I still have requests for, and I still hand off to people and I still have students ask for, for me to be a, a writer for their letters of recommendation based on those projects. So those are, I think those are extreme um, successes. Um, I, I think the, the other piece is all the spinoff um, projects, right? As Brandy said, when people come back and say, yes, we want to do this or yes, and can we, can we do this? Um, I think I've been involved in so many projects, whether they're a formal part of my research or whether they're part of the classroom or whether um, there's something entirely different that um, are projects I never imagined that I would have a chance to be involved in. And now I'm part of this, this broader community of folks, um, not only pushing forward the field, but actually doing impactful things that are um, providing broader access to collections and impacting more people through their availability to, to access those materials. So th that's really exciting too. It's, it's a, um, just not being able to predict where things are going to, things are going to go. So I didn't prep you guys with this question, but I want to flip that question on you. Um, because I think sometimes it's, as interesting to, to, to hear about what hasn't gone well as what has gone well. And so 
you could either you can answer in two ways. Either you can, you know, name a time of about something that didn't go well, or just what has been a challenge um, as part of your community engaged research that you know has been something that you've had a lesson learned from. Oh, <laughs> I mean, this may take up the whole time. <laughs> We're all like, oh, I can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I know the answer to that question. Um, I will say that one one ongoing challenge is um, other institutional structures that are supposed to make things easier and actually make it more difficult. Um, so, for example, right now we have we have a, we have one of the magic things where a group has come to us to one of our, to the Superfund Research Center and asked for us to sort of basically do a citizen science community engaged project. We are pumped, right? This is what we want to do. We also need to compensate them for their time. They are providing labor for this project. Now, <laughs> here we go. Now it's time to get the budget people at the university to talk to our financial folks at NIEHS and make sure everybody's in agreement. And all I'm trying to do is to make sure that these community partners who are awesome community organizers, fantastic people, please, for the love of God, do not make them create an NIH biosketch. This is a complete waste of time, right? And there's no reason that a resume isn't legible to everybody else. So like, this is where I'm at right now. Um, and it's one of those kind of ridiculous project, you know, things that I was like, don't make them make the bio sketch, just take the resume, They're, you know, like you can read it, it's okay. Um, so actually those silly little things about institutional processes often are the things that make me grind my teeth a little bit. I mean, I'll add like, we, often you know the timelines the turnarounds sort of expectation setting communicate constant communication those all end up being challenges in one way or another you know i can talk a specific project where you know the community came to us and we worked with them and they really wanted to know you know is this a problem for us and everything takes far longer than you expect it to do and that that's and that's never we're not like a a research, you know, I'm not like a, a pay for service lab that can kind of immediately just kind of turn this out. We're using students, we're doing other things. Instruments break. One of the students was out sampling when the derecho hit. I mean, everything was just, and so it's, you know, I, I feel terrible about that, those instances when it, people sometimes look for quick answers, think that this won't be more long and involved, and yet the process takes time and then may end on an unsatisfactory you view answer in some ways. I mean, we do sometimes get communities that come to us that sort of want to find, you know, they can't believe when we say, well, everything kind of looks okay. After we've done all of our research, there's really not a lot here that you all need to be concerned about. And so I guess that's what I get in terms of the timelines and expectation settings and, you know, really the ups and downs of research and really making sure everyone's on the same page of what that means in terms of things like the deliverables that might come from it and, and when they, they might sort of know their answer. Um, those, those projects are hard. They, they make me nervy, nervous and squeamish every time because we've all had research projects that go sideways and maybe don't go the way we think they're going to go. But now you're doing it with a much more unique uh, set of circumstances and a, and a unique team. I'd, I'd echo all of that. And I think working in the classroom is often the most, I think the place where I felt the most tension, I don't think I've ever had a project completely fail, but classrooms are kind of, they can be very rigid spaces, right? I think students come in with a very clear set of expectations and then you're trying to meet a set of goals for the course. And, you know, as Dave reflected, these projects don't always go the way that you think they're going to, to go. So I think being um, flexible and um, willing to demonstrate where maybe mistakes have been made or things might not have gone the way that you anticipated, um, it makes you a little vulnerable, I think, both as a researcher and an instructor, right? And that's a that's sometimes, it's not where we're, it's certainly not where I was trained to be as an instructor. So it took, I think, some um, there's, there's some extra bravery that I think comes from, um, in being the lead on those projects from the classroom perspective. Um, and I think too, putting the students in a situation where things are a little bit more dynamic and trying to work against an institutional structure, um, as Brandy reflected, right? Grades are a very rigid thing. So how do you, 
how do you work in a dynamic project that ultimately has a set of deliverables that have a very real impact even on the students, let alone the community, um, and build that framework in? It seems like in other situations, you can kind of, you can bob and weave a little bit differently. Um, but I think being self-reflective about the practice, um, really spending time thinking about how you develop the syllabus, um, sharing the syllabus with the community partners, like th those are all steps that have that have helped to alleviate that and are small things sometimes that um, that I've learned over the years to try and make those projects a little little bit more successful. I, I find this work incredibly humbling. <laughs> I mean, like at all, I mean, you said you said vulnerable, and I completely agree. And in many ways, this is a, it. I always feel like um, no matter what I, I how I think things will work or how they'll go, it's it's never that way. In the the missteps feel amplified a thousand times because you've got, you know, if it's if it's me and my research lab, that's one thing, right? Like there's sort of understanding that things won't work, and then we and at least we pay and some of these other things probably don't pay them nearly enough. Um, but when you're working with community members and you're really trying to work on a shared goal, it just it, it, to me personally, it hurts more when it doesn't work the way you want it to. And so, and, and inevitably, there's always stuff that I feel like, oh, I shouldn't have thought I, I took that for granted or I, I had that wrong assumption. So it's also a constant process of just sort of like you're, you got to be reflective and, and learning as you go because it's, it's never it's never perfect. I, I will say some of those places have been the most productive and generative spots in a in a project the ones that go absolutely smoothly I, I and you don't have those opportunities I think are often the ones that um maybe aren't as more memorable or interesting in the end or may not lead to different spin-offs of other of other projects um uh which is something I always try and tell the students uh those are great places to stop and reflect and think about how you would move forward differently so I have one more question for you guys, and I want to end on a high note. Um, so, you know, you're, you're, you're seasoned researchers. You've been doing this for a long time. You know, how has community engagement sort of influenced the trajectory of your career and what you've been involved with as a researcher? What, if you think of sort of the totality of your work this far, how has community engagement impacted it? I'll, I'll start. Um, I I really enjoy it. Maybe maybe you wouldn't think that after what we just talked about. Um, I, there was a comment made about you know we, we get into doing the research at least particularly on the engineering side and someone who cares about water quality and environmental quality like you want to have an impact. And I did the tenure track and 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 did all that and did all the things I was supposed to do and it felt very unsatisfying because it felt like it, it you know I was far removed from I think the visions I had when I got into what I'd be doing in this field. This makes me feel like I am doing um, what like we should be doing as academics that have expertise that should benefit society at large and do it in a way that's not like extractive or exploitive, but collaborative and equitable. Um, so I, I, while it's fraught with peril at times, um, and it, I, it's all I want to do. And I, I know that it means that if I take, I understand that's a very privileged thing to say, like now being a full professor, and I wish we could find ways to make it where more people at any stage in their academic career could do this work and not have to worry about bean counting and products. Um, you know, so what I'll say is it, it's, it's the most rewarding things that I do, even when it doesn't work. And when I say it's humbling, it's in a good way, because it makes me think that no matter how many papers I'm publishing on really sophisticated science, that there's still just basic issues with people's water quality and environmental issues that are leading to public health outcomes that we shouldn't accept. And we should be working with people and, and trying to empower them to do more. I, I think that's, I, I've, it's strange, it's, it's hard to imagine, I'm sitting in a space where I'm a seasoned researcher, it's, it's kind of hard for me to wrap my head around that at this point, but I mean, I've done this work throughout, um, throughout my career from a graduate student through to assistant professor and, and now as associate. Um, so those pathways are there. And I think the culture is changing. Um, as I kind of mentioned in my introduction, I was cautioned against continuing to do community engaged research, um, that it was going to be difficult to make tenure. Um, but there, there are lots of ways to do it if you're willing to, um, if you, if you have the right framework and structure, right, which we have, we have incredible resources and people here at the, at the University of Iowa, 
um, and folks to collaborate with and talk through how, so how do I turn this into a publication? Um, how do I incorporate this into my teaching? Um, and I think there are ways to make that visible across your CV as you're sitting for tenure and promotion to show that, yes, this has, this has impacted every aspect of, of what I do uh, as a, as a scholar. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's something that, I, I think it's any, 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 anybody at any stage in their career can, can engage in. Um, and the, um, the, the benefits to that, I, I, I mean, my, my research and my understanding of, um, of the area of study have only increased because I have that many more people to talk to about how this is impacting their practice, about understanding their perspectives. Um, so it's, um, humbling and invigorating and exciting. Um, and it, it has, I, I think, only been, it has, I don't, I can't imagine shaping my career without, without doing this work and continuing to engage with community. Yeah, I second and third, all of that. I think it, it's what makes it interesting. I think like, you know, I, like Dave, I think if I, if I felt like that, I, I couldn't do this work, I would be really unsatisfied with the, the work that I, that, you know, with a, with a research world. Um, my particular, um, position is a little, I'm clinical track. So I, I, I do agree one of the challenges is sort of getting the, the peer reviewed publication trajectory um, lined up with community engaged work. It's hard. And I say it's hard it, as an anthropologist where we tend to write as individuals and a little slower, it maybe feels easier than in public health where the man, they crank out a lot of publications over here in public health. Um, and that's just hard. It's a hard track to keep up with. So not being on the tenure track, and all, despite all the vulnerabilities that go with that have actually been more beneficial to being able to kind of spread out a little bit. I feel like I have a little more elbow room. Um, I feel like I can say, this takes time. Community engaged research takes time. That's what you've hired me to do, this work. So just simmer down, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna do it right. <laughs> you know, and, and I, can, I can kind of say that because I don't quite have the, the same, you know, that the tenure sort of clock isn't ticking in the same way. So um, I also, I, I see ambiguity as an opportunity. So I tend to try to say, look, this is, you know, this is why, this is how these things come together. And, you know, the, the, this, this makes sense for me and it adds value to the work that the college does. And we're all, I've gotten good feedback from that. I think, I think my colleagues agree, um, but it, it certainly looks a little different, but for me, it's, um, I think I wouldn't be happy doing any other thing. I, you know, I feel I like I like hanging out with people in the community. That's you know, um, and I get to do that. So that's a good thing. And I'll just add that I firmly believe, particularly for STEM students these days, that this is a great way to prep our students. There's so much learning and training, and and that and, and a lot of them want this type of work where they feel like they're working towards something that's societally relevant and towards a societal good. So. Um, I you know one more thing of really just trying to advocate for these types of efforts here on campus because I think our students benefit from it in the long run. Well, I want to thank you all. This has been really inspiring to both of you. Um, I want to thank you for your work. I want to thank you for the impact you're having, and I want to thank you for being with us today. Um, so, Dave, Brandy, Lindsay, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left, which is just enough time to bring Aaron up and hear about this really exciting grant program um, that his office is kicking off. So Aaron, I will turn it over to you and you should be able to share your screen if you would like. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you, Heather, uh, the panelists, Lindsay, Brandy, Dave. Uh, as everyone said, it was really inspiring to hear. Um, probably don't know this, but I kind of started my career at the university in the College of Public Health. Uh, kind of learn about community uh, participatory research, kind of the importance of community engaged research. Uh, so with that said, you know, I, I wrote a three, P3 proposal within the last year. Uh, it had four thrusts to it, and I really wanted to make sure that one of those thrusts was on community engagement. So I'm going to share with you the community engaged scholars program here. There. Um, so there's an RFP. I'll also drop that into chat here in a second. Uh, that'll have more details. I just kind of pulled out the highlights that I wanted folks to know about today for this PowerPoint. Um, and then happy to answer any questions for folks as we go through it. So, and my cat's biting me, so I may need to 
leave here for a second. Uh, but uh, the Community Engaged Scholars Program. So it's really about assisting in creating and solidifying community research and scholarship partnerships here in Iowa. Um, let me pull up my other screen here. There we go. Um, we want to enable and sustain community engaged research partnerships. And really, I think what we've heard today is it's about reciprocally benefiting both the community and folks here at the university, uh, you know, students, the researchers, uh, the university at large. Uh, one thing I do want to know is the existing partnerships are eligible for this program, but what we would ask is, is you kind of have a new direction for that partnership. Um, so if you've worked with certain communities and, you know, I think Heather made the point, you know, what's the definition of community? Uh, we leave that up to you to define in your proposal, uh, but we just ask that, you know, if you have an existing relationship with folks, that is kind of a new direction from what you've done in the past. And also critically important is these partners should be involved uh, substantially in the project. So either developing it, implementing it, um, you know, both. Again, we kind of leave that up to you uh, as you write your proposal to, to make the argument about what that substantial involvement is. Uh, but we, we want them to have a voice in this project. Um, the expected outcomes from these proposals is, you know, collect feasibility or pilot data uh, that's going to enable you to submit grants after. You know, I, I, I've kind of floated around the university a number of years and, you know, I, I think a consistent story I've heard from folks is it's, it's hard to find funds to support this type of work. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that you had some sufficient funds to do that. Um, and then to be able to, uh, to go after those larger grants afterwards. Um, provide a significant impact to the community. Uh, I left out two words on that last bullet point there, but really it's about making an impact in the community. So, um, you know, with their involvement, um, hopefully you're able to, to improve the lives of the folks there. And then really, again, build successful partnerships. So we're not looking at this as to be a, a one-off relationship where you, you do this, this project and then you're done. Uh, we're really hoping to see that this is a way to start uh, relationships with communities and kind of build from there. Uh, so we want to see kind of these aspects within your proposals, so um, things to consider. So we are doing a letter of intent process. Um, those are due February 4th. The letters of intent are just one page. Uh, the details are kind of in that RFP that I dropped the link in the chat. Um, but, you know, we really want to know what's the research question, how's it going to impact the community, and, and how are you going to evaluate your projects, uh, the success of your projects. Those are going to be reviewed by uh, a group of campus research leaders who are experienced in community-engaged research and scholarship. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and probably invite 10 or so proposals, full proposals from those letters of intent. Uh, we anticipate funding about five of those proposals. So if you get it to the full proposal, you know, ideally you've got about 50% success rate uh, for funding. Uh, so we're, we're trying to make sure if you put in the effort, you know, there's hopefully some return there uh, with that 50% success rate. And then just some of the other key details I wanted to, to share with everybody. Uh, in terms of eligibility, so we're asking for four team leaders for this project. Uh, two of those would be from the University of Iowa. Uh, either faculty or staff, uh, the faculty tenure track, clinical track, research track, or staff who have research as a major component of their um, job. Uh, and then the community partners, again, it's, it's up to you who those folks are. They could be organizations, they could be folks from the community. Uh, again, we just ask you to define that for us, uh, but you've got some flexibility there. Uh, the other kind of little caveat there is the projects need to be conducted in the state of Iowa. Um, so. In terms of budget, it's $50,000 maximum for one year. Um, no faculty salary allowed, but staff and student salary is allowed. So you can hire students, hire staff, if you need a coordinator for the project, um, things like that. And then, you know, we realize that the, the community partners are putting time and effort into this. So we wanna make sure that that's reflected. And so honoraria for the community partners is allowed. Um, so, you know, we, again, it's, it's important that they're valued and they make sure that they realize that they're valued, so we want to make sure that we're able to compensate them for their efforts. Um, in terms of the proposals, it's going to be five pages or less. Uh, the, what we're looking for is in the RFP, it was in the, the chat, um, must be focused on a research and scholarship question that significantly impacts the community. Uh, so there does need to be a research question kind of driving this relationship and this project, and it must impact the community. And then as I mentioned earlier, 
They will be reviewed by, a, I think it's about 10 or 11 uh, campus research leaders who will ultimately review these projects. Um, so we'll do some initial scoring. We'll kind of do, you know, a NIH style panel discussion at the end uh, where everybody has an opportunity to discuss all of the proposals. Uh, and then from that, we'll, we'll fund hopefully the top five proposals. So these are just kind of the high level details I wanted to share with you. I'm happy to answer any questions if folks have that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Seeing no questions at this point, I will wait. And I'll also say um, you can always reach out to me after this. Happy to chat with you one-on-one. -on -one. We can set up a Zoom call, do it by email. Um, just, just let me know if you want to chat about stuff and what questions you might have. I know we only have a couple of minutes left, but I did see Lisa's hand up. Lisa, do you want to ask her question? I did. Could you give us, Aaron? Um, thank you for that overview. Could you give us a little bit of idea about what that letter of intent should look like? Do you have a template or some guidance? So if you go to the, the, the RFP, um, you know, how I would structure the letter of intent is... So a brief abstract of the research scholarship question, you know, I'd probably do a header like that and then kind of talk about that. Uh, there'd be a section about, you know, who the community partners are and how they're going to be involved in it. I'd put a header right there. Um, maybe something about the overall community impacts. And then, you know, uh, another section on, you know, metrics for evaluating the success of the project. Randy, did I see a question from you? Did you have a question? I was just going to ask, since it's an NIH um, review style, if they have to submit an NIH biosketch. <laughs> the answer, Aaron, <laughs> is no. no. Uh, the community partners do not know. Um, you know, I, I hope I made that clear in there now that you said that. You did a CVs or resumes. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so the researchers, uh, definitely a CV or biosketch, and then, you know, resumes for the community partners. Trying to make this easy, you know, trying. Well, guys, we, we have one minute left here. So I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, I want to thank everybody for participating. I want to thank Heather for her presentation, which was fantastic. Um, I want to thank Brandy and Dave and Lindsay for their wonderful panel. That was really inspiring for me to, to hear. Um, I want to thank Aaron for his leadership and vision for thinking about putting in a P3 proposal around community engaged research and getting it funded. Um, so thank you, Aaron. Um, and thank all of you for your interest in community engagement, for showing up um, at a Zoom session in the middle of winter break on the coldest day of the year, January 6th. Um, and so I just really want to thank all of you. It's inspiring for me to see this community, to see all of you and the work that you're doing. Um, we will be sending out the materials from today's from today's webinar to everybody. So um, don't worry about that. If 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 um, if you want the information, you will have it. Um, and this has been recorded, and so it will also be going on the Office of Community Engagement website underneath our webinar series, which you can find all of our workshops that we've done on the website there. So with that, I want to thank everybody, and I hope everybody has a, a great rest of the week and happy.